the end of it. Karen Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gray. And I'm very happy to follow the uh, Honourable Member for Stratton because I think he, he's made some, some very, very powerful points. The petition that we're talking about has over 4 million signatures, I think. And to me, at least, I think it is an understandable expression of pain and anger in response to what was a bitterly fought EU referendum campaign, which has left this country, as he has said, deeply divided. Pain and anger felt certainly in my own constituency of Brighton Pavilion. It had one of the highest rates of people voting to remain, around 69%, and indeed also one of the highest numbers of people signing this petition, around 19,500 at the last count. But however much many of us might wish the outcome of this referendum had been different, and I certainly do, and however much we might argue that the level of lies and misinformation during the campaign undermines the legitimacy of that outcome, I do agree with those who have said very clearly that the bottom line surely has to be that trying to impose a retrospective threshold and effectively rerun the referendum is bad politics and worse democracy. What better way would there indeed be to reinforce the perception that the so-called metropolitan elites care nothing for those in more distant and perhaps disconnected communities than simply to ignore everything that they have said? Instead, I think that the anger and alienation felt by many who voted leave urgently needs to be addressed. Because for many, I believe it was a howl of rage against exclusion and powerlessness. And their voices have to be heard, not just at the referendum, but year-round, and I'd argue that a crucial way to do that is to crack open the current political system that encourages the main parties to listen almost exclusively to swing voters in marginal seats at general elections and to ignore everybody else. If we're to set about healing the deep divisions in society which this referendum has laid bare, then one task must be to urgently build a more representative, inclusive democracy, and that can only be brought about through electoral reform. I think if the Brexit campaigners were serious about giving people back control, a good place to start would be democratic control. A political system that delivers government on the basis of just 24% of the eligible vote clearly does not give us that. So, Brexit means Brexit, so we are told. Well, the reason that I believe that we need a second referendum on the terms of any Brexit deal is because I think we have absolutely no idea what is on the other side of that door marked Brexit. We might have chosen to open that door, but we have no idea, not even the dimmest shape, of what on earth is on the other side, even now, two months after the vote. Now, the government's alternatives to EU membership, they have a paper on that, gave four alternative options. The BBC listed five. The Centre for European Reform sets out seven. Which of these was voted for by those who were voting leave? Well, none of them. How many will we end up with? Well, one of them. So what parliamentary scrutiny, or indeed public scrutiny, have we had of an actual plan to leave the EU? Absolutely none, because there wasn't one and there isn't one. And so that is why I strongly support not just maximum parliamentary scrutiny, but calls for a further referendum to, on the terms of Brexit, once they are clear, and on our future relationship with the EU, so that we can all assess what that actually looks like in the real world. Because during the campaign, when pressed on the alternative to EU membership, Leave campaigners would squeal that they couldn't possibly be expected to answer those questions because they weren't a government in waiting, but rather they wanted the British people to be in control. Well, what would fulfill that promise more thoroughly than ensuring the public gets the opportunity to cast a positive vote for what a potential Brexit looks like in addition to their vote against remaining part of the EU? And before that referendum on the terms of Brexit takes place, I think lessons absolutely must be learnt and the government needs to take a long, hard look at the Electoral Reform Society's report called Doing Referendums Differently. Let me just quote a few things from it. They say there were glaring democratic deficiencies in the run-up to the vote, with previously unreleased polling showing that far too many people felt they were ill-informed about the issues. It goes on, the top-down, personality-based nature of the debate failed to address major political, and, uh, major political policies and subjects, leaving the public in the dark. And finally, misleading claims could be made with impunity. And that rec report calls for a root and branch review of referendums, learning the lessons of the EU campaign to make sure the mistakes that were made in terms of regulation, tone and conduct are never repeated. And I would absolutely echo that call. Because it is clear that there was so much misinformation, and yes, it was on all sides, but I do 
believe that on the Leave side that was particularly egregious. We were told that we could end freedom of movement and keep full access to the single market. We were told we can, could continue to benefit from being part of the single market, yet somehow take back control. I will in just two seconds and make all of our rules here in the UK and, and, and cease having to follow EU rules. And then the famous £350 million a week for the NHS. Truth is, we won't have any extra money, let alone an amount anywhere near the lie of all lies that disgrace the side of a perfectly innocent bus for months on end. I give away. Uh, is the Honourable Lady aware that the EU has free trade agreements with some 50 countries, only three of which have in return granted free movement of labour and made a contribution to the EU, all three because their governments were planning to enter the EU. The other 47 have free trade agreements with no free movement, no contribution. Why should we be different? Lucas. Is the Right Honourable gentlemen aware that there is a wealth of difference between free trade and being part of the single market. He has talked on uh, at length about tariff barriers. The big issue about membership of the Absolutely. WTO is non-tariff barriers. You know, he really should keep up with where the debate is at, Absolutely. because that is where it's at right now. All of this focus on tariffs was a very clever red herring for most people that don't know about trade agreements, but I've actually studied trade agreements. I've worked on them for years, and I can tell him there is a wealth of difference between trade agreements and membership of the single market, and that was yet another lie perpetrated during this referendum campaign. Going forward, we need people to be given a say and to have real control over the terms of any Brexit deal. We need maximum public engagement and parliamentary scrutiny. And that means the government must set out its plan for what it wants Brexit to look like. It needs to present it to the people, I believe, in an early general election to secure a mandate that currently it does not have. And then it needs to ensure full and proper parliamentary debate and scrutiny, and only then allow MPs to vote on whether to invoke Article 50 and set in train the formal process of leaving so we know what direction that train is going in. In addition, we should be arguing for wider public engagement, giving opportunities for meaningful input throughout the process, as well as maximising input from civil society organisations, NGOs, charities, businesses, local authorities and other stakeholders. To, cl to claim that we want to take back control of the UK's future, but to refuse measures to maximise parliamentary and public scrutiny, I think is unforgivable, I think it's contradictory, and I think it's harmful. So, Greens argued during the referendum campaign that outside the EU there's a very real danger. The UK will seek to compete with other countries by weakening social and environmental protections and by becoming effectively a tax haven. That is still the case. So I think that in this debate running up to a second referendum on the terms of a Brexit, some of the key issues that we'll be wanting to keep in mind in terms of how we might vote on that second referendum will be things like whether or not we can maintain freedom of movement and full rights of EU citizens in the UK, whether we can continue to have full access to the single market, whether we can have crucially important environmental protections that we currently enjoy thanks to our EU membership, whether that's on air or water or wildlife. And not just keeping what we have, we should be improving that and absolutely locking that down in law. And one of the big concerns I think people have right now is about what is going to happen to things like the Habitats Directive, the Birds Directive. These are gold standard when it comes to environmental protection. And what we need to see is those preserved in any new environmental uh, settlement. That needs to be perhaps in a new environmental act. But whatever happens, we must not see a race to the bottom in terms of standards. We need to retain EU-derived workers' rights, social and consumer protections, and human rights, again, as a bare minimum that we should seek to build on. We should be putting young people first. And finally... Uh, I believe that we should be asking the government right now to make a guarantee to EU nationals who've made this country their home in good faith that the government should say right now that they are welcome to stay, they have an absolute right to stay. Anything less than that is simply using people's lives as cynical chips in a bargaining negotiation, and that is neither right nor moral. Mr. James Cleverley.